From Vitam Biko Chinoko, he is a regional advocacy lead for CARE International in Southern Africa and joins us now from Madrid. Thank you for joining us on the program. Uh, first, I want to get your thoughts on the conclusion of the COP25. Do you think that it was a failure? Yeah, I must say that I think we, uh, as civil society, we are very disappointed by the lack of this. Uh, lack of connection between uh, the negotiations and the things that are happening on the ground. Uh, there is, we, we don't have shortage of science, we don't have shortage of evidence, uh, but what has actually displayed, been displayed in this conference is something that I've never seen in my eight years of negotiations. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm really very disappointed. We didn't expect to come out uh, with such a very disappointing outcome. So I'm really disappointed. Right. The COP25 did pass some declarations on climate change, but postponed a key decision on global carbon markets until next year. Why are governments not able to reach an agreement on this issue? So what is um, the sticking point here? The sticking point basically is the, uh, whether we could allow uh, governments that already have our carbon credits from the previous uh, climate regime to carry them over into the new Paris Agreement. And our view is that I think if we need to increase ambition, we don't need to carry those carbon credits into the new climate regime, while we do have those that do have uh, a lot of carbon sinks uh, saying that they really want to have these carbon uh, credits are carried over into the, uh, into the new climate uh, regime. Uh, so really it's about uh, ambition. We think that if we do carry them over, we actually be compromising on ambition. Uh, but on the other hand, there are also very sticky issues around how do we want to use our carbon credits to tackle climate change. I think the previous experience that we've had was that uh, carbon markets have actually contravened and breached uh, people's rights, uh, have actually pre uh, 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 compromised food production. So we don't want to repeat those kind of, 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 of experiences in the new climate regime. This is why we do have this whole aspect around non-market mechanisms around carbon credits. And the fact that developing countries, developed countries are not willing to go uh, the route that we're, we're, we're asking them, it just actually shows that they really want to repeat the same mistakes that we had uh, around carbon markets in the previous regime, which is not going to help anyone. Like I was saying, we don't have a shortage of science, we don't have a shortage of evidence around the impacts of climate change, and we're very disappointed with the outcome from Madrid. Yeah, I know you've said that several times that you were disappointed, but do you think anything positive came out of the summit? Yeah, so I might say that I think we do uh, acknowledge the goodwill and um, a gesture of ambition from the EU. So the EU was able to come up with the long-term plans and mention that they really want to go net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, my own opinion is that they could have done much better than that, but the fact that they have come out and said they want to go net zero by 2050 is something very positive. I also want to mention that we've had, we've seen some uh, positives around loss and damage. Uh, so really, the establishment of a network on loss and damage that is a very positive uh, outcome. Uh, but also more than that, to talk about uh, to institutionalize the review uh, on loss and damage every five years, so that we're able to stock take and come up with new strategies of tackling loss and damage. So. Those could be some of the things that I would, I would mention as, as our positives, but overall, that doesn't actually improve the final outcome. Right. So what do you think needs to happen for governments to finally make the changes needed to combat climate change? Because the science has been clear. We've been told time and time again that this is a critical time and drastic steps need to be taken, and yet governments aren't taking those drastic steps. Yeah, so what needs to happen is very uh, simple, and every, every government knows what they need to do. I think for developed countries, uh, their line of action should fall around two things. One, cutting down on emissions, because one, they do have the advantage of technology, they do have the advantage of science, they can easily go uh, to renewables and cut on fossil fuels. Uh, for developing countries, I must say that I think they're really trying hard uh, to come up with very ambitious plans. Their economies are still not locked up in fossil fuels, but they will need actually a lot of support on technology and finance to help them mobilize and uh, go the uh, low carbon route. And all these things we do ask them that they do come under the, the rules of the convention, because that's the only way that we can incentivize action on climate change. Other than that, I think then we'll be coming every year and again and we'll be singing the same song while communities will be suffering on impacts of cyclones, uh, which have been caused by climate change, will be, will, be, will be suffering around issues of hunger because people cannot adapt. 
we need to have to, to be very proactive. We need to come out very strongly and provide the finance that is needed for developing countries. But more than that, really re-engineer re our economies towards low-carbon development. All right, Vaitambiko Chinoko, thank you for your time.